So I want to talk to you guys about the weird shit of the past. And yes, I will use the SH word. We're not in elementary school anymore. Stop giving me a hard time about it. I don't care. So, as I was saying, I'm sick and tired of censoring myself. All right, I got enough censorship from YouTube. I don't need to hear censorship from you guys. We all know <laughs> we all know you guys use this type of terminology in your own pri private lives. So, <clears throat> I will speak the way that I wish to speak. And if you guys don't like it, you guys can watch uh, Fox News. You guys can watch The Daily Caller or The Daily Wire. You guys can go watch your conservative friends living in California. Dave Rubin, Prager, uh, Shapiro, etc. Well, Shapiro left California, but he's still a Californian, so to hell with that guy. But anyway, anyway. I want to talk to you guys about the weird stuff of the past, the weird ideologies of the past. And by the past, I'm talking about within the modern era. So the 18th century, 20th century, 19th century, et cetera, et cetera. Pretty much within that, uh, that window of time, that epoch, that, that duration. So we have communism, Nazism, but we also have other things. Um, you can go as far back as the medieval period. I know the medieval period is not the modern era, but we'll include the medieval period as well. You can go back to the medieval period and you can read stories about nuns and monks involved in the occult, involved in witchcraft and human sacrifice and all this stuff. And you can read those stories and you can say, well, that's pretty damn weird. I'm glad we're not living in those days, but you'd be wrong because that kind of stuff is still here. You can read about the Nazis, and you can say, well, I'm glad those guys are gone. Ah, they're still around. You guys can read about the gulags and the communists, and you can say, well, those, you know, glad we're not living in those days anymore. Oh, but commies are still around. The evils of the past are still here. I was thinking about this today. I was going for a walk, and it was a very, very foggy day today. I love foggy days. I don't know about you guys, but everyone talks about sunshine and blue skies. That, to me, is just boring and depressing. I don't want blue skies and sunlight. Sunlight is death. The sun brings death. You get enough sunlight, you end up with a desert. Who the hell wants that? I want life, my friends. I want life. I want rain. I want fog. I want mist. That's life. I want that invigorating atmosphere. I want to have a day that, that, that makes me feel like I'm living in the middle of a horror movie. That's the kind of action that I want. That, that's, that's some vibrancy right there. That's energy right there. That's what I want. But anyway. Anyway. Uh, I was thinking about this in my walk, and yeah, all the weird stuff of the past is still here. It never went away. So you guys can uh, look this up. This is a very, very fascinating story. I, I don't know how to pronounce this um, French name, but it's like Catherine. Hold on. I want to get this right. Catherine. Mo hold on. Oh, here it is. Catherine Monvoisin. I, okay, this was a French occultist who lived in the 17th century. I don't know how to pronounce her last name, Monvoisin. I guess it's like Monvois or something, Mon, Monvoisois or whatever. But because I don't speak French and I don't really, I'm not really intending to learn French, I'm just going to pronounce it in my own anglicized way, and that is Monvoisin. Catherine Monvoisin was a witch and an occultist who ran an occult network, and they were responsible for the deaths of at least a thousand people. That is the most conservative estimate that we have, but there are some estimates which put the number at around 2,500 people. Uh, regardless of the number you choose, uh, that is a hell of a lot of people to kill, be it 1,000 people or 2,500 people. These people were murderers, and they were occultists. <coughs> And they were involved in black masses. And you can say, well, black masses, it's all just a myth. This woman was probably innocent. She probably wasn't involved in any of that stuff. We all know that everyone in the medieval period hated women, so why the hell are we picking on this poor woman? She was absolutely innocent. That's all fake, right? All that stuff is all faked up. But then you can read about tales from the medieval period, and you can read about stories of monks and nuns being investigated by the Inquisition, being involved in the occult being involved in all sorts of witchery, Kabbalism. Probably one of the most famous examples of this is the story of Gilles de Rai. That's one French name that I can kind of pronounce. But Gilles, 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 de, Rai, Gilles de Rai, he was the right-hand guy of Joan of Arc. I will not call her Saint Joan of Arc. 
Everyone calls her Saint Joan of Arc. I will not call Joan of Arc Saint Joan of Arc. Why? Because she was not declared a saint until the 19th century. And the reason why the Catholic Church declared her to be a saint was because the Catholic Church wanted to maintain diplomatic ties with the anti-clerical government of France. And so they chose someone that all of the French people, both uh, atheist or, or Catholic, admired, and that was Joan of Arc. She was a symbol of nationalism because she fought against the English in the 100 Years' War. So they declared her to be a saint, and that was only for political reasons. Um, before that, that she was classified as a heretic. She was confirmed to be a heretic. She was confirmed to be a false prophet. There wasn't really any serious evidence that she had received any sort of uh, um, a vision from the from God or the Virgin Mary. She was a violent uh, nationalist who engaged in false prophecy, and I refuse to call her a saint. But she also had a right-hand guy who was an absolute psychopath. His name was Gilles de Rai. Gilles de Rai fought in the 100 Years War, and after the war was over, Gilles de Rai had this dream of becoming a play director. He had this um, vision in his head that he would you know, direct a play, kind of like how people today want to direct films, or they want to be actors, and they go to Hollywood, and they fail, and they end up doing porn, or they end up moving back to mom and dad after they do porn and pick up an STD. But anyway, <coughs> um, yeah, uh, uh, Gilles de Rai uh, had this vision of making a play, and he uh, wrote a script for it, and it uh, required a lot of actors and a lot of props and a lot of clothes design. And uh, a play uh, of this magnitude would have cost a lot of money. In fact, they say that Gilles de Rai's play is considered to be the... Uh, the, the it's like the biggest play that was ever done big not in the sense of its popularity it failed but big in the sense of the the, the amount of actors that it required the amount of props the amount the amount of money this was the most expensive play ever done within that that time that time period and Jill Durai, you know he 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 uh, didn't have any money to do this play so he got money from his relatives and i think he got some loans and he did the play, and it was a failure, and nobody wanted to see it, and it wasn't a one-hit wonder. It was it was like these movies that come out that have extremely high budgets, and they fail. And then you have a movie like No Country for Old Men, which is a cheap, low-budget movie, and it's you know, a cult classic. Gilles de Rai, uh, was in the former of the two, and his play utterly failed. It completely failed, and he was in uh, debt up to his ass, and uh, <clears throat> he didn't know what to do. He was in desperation. So Gilles, Gilles de Rai went to a priest, and he said, Father, I don't know what to do. I am in debt. I did this play. It failed. I am in debt. I, I don't know what to do. I am broke. Help me, help me. And the priest said, My son, there is a man that I know that I refer people to once in a while in very serious situations like this. Normally, I would just tell people to say the rosary and pray and fast. But for your case, my son, I have a very, very special friend who can help you. And he brought, he introduced Gilles de Rai. He connected Gilles de Rai with this man. And this man was an Italian occultist. And he, I believe he was Italian. He could have been French. I'm pretty sure he was Italian. He was involved in the Kabbalah and Kabbalism, Jewish uh, occultism. And he... Uh, began to invoke a demon, an abysmal spirit for Gilles de Rai. And he told Gilles, the demon will give you the money that you so seek, but it wants something in return. Oh, what is it? What is it, sir? Tell me. The demon requires the blood of children. And so Gilles de Rai did just that to appeal to this demon. He murdered hundreds of children. Not only did he murder them, but he raped them and he... Put them, put them through all sorts of sadistic, sadistic machinations. Absolutely horrific what this guy did. He was a complete monster. Demonic. Absolutely demonic. He was satanic. But that was an example <coughs> of people in the priesthood who are involved in the occult, because who connected Gilles de Rai with the occultist? It was a priest. And you can read these stories, and you can say, ha, oh, it's all just fairy tales, medieval hysteria and paranoia. Come on, this is all nonsense. And then you read stories of priests involved in human sacrifice, the murder of children for some sort of occultic belief. You read about these things. There's a story that was like this. It was from the, 
I want to say it was from the 10th century, and it was a group of occultists who lived in a city in France called Orleans. You know, we have New Orleans in Louisiana. Well, the original Orleans is in France. Louisiana used to be uh, occupied by the French. There are some people there who still speak French, believe it or not, and that's the only language they want to speak. It's quite weird that hundreds of years later, we still have Frenchies acting as though they're still living in Paris. But anyway, Mr. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Priest... And Miss Nunn, uh, well, I don't know. If, I think they were nuns. Yeah, they were nuns involved in this. They were they were having orgies uh, in in their meetings, and then uh, the women they got pregnant from the orgies would uh, give birth, and those children were sacrificed. And the way that they would sacrifice the child is they would start a giant bonfire, and then they would play hot potato with the baby. I'm not even joking. This is what the medieval text tells us. They would play hot potato with the baby, but they would get really, really close to the fire so that essentially as they were playing hot potato with the baby, you know, the baby would get passed on from person to person to person, and it would go around in a circle. They were close enough to the fire that they were essentially cooking this child alive. It was like a rotisserie effect and just circulating this baby around the fire until the, ba until the baby died from, from heat. Uh, excess excessive heat. And then they would uh, burn the child's body and then they would take the ashes, and with those ashes, they would make a little uh, disc of bread. They would bake it, and they would say, here lies the true Eucharist. Here lies the true flesh of, of God. And they would consume that cake made from the ashes of burned children. And you can sit here and say, oh, it's all fake. It's all nonsense. It's not nonsense, guys. It's real. People don't get, and those people got arrested, and they were executed for those crimes. People don't get arrested. There's not investigations on things like this. People don't write records of these invest investigations and the trials of these people and the fact that they documented the executions of these people. People don't go out of their way in that sort of rigorous documentation for stories that are fake. <clears throat> St. Bernardino of Siena speaks of stories like this as well. And... Uh, there was a uh, in the in the uh, I want to say in the Renaissance period there was actually a uh, a a priest uh, he was an Italian priest by the name of Antonio de Zagara Zacarra Antonio Zacarra Zacarra is C A C C A R A it's Zacarra Antonio Zacarra was a priest by day and at night he was a devil worshipper uh, he actually wrote a um, he actually wrote a hymn in dedication to um, to Satan, and he didn't call it Satan, but he called it um, he called it uh, Pluto, a, a hymn in dedication to Pluto, the god of the underworld, the Greek god of the underworld. So these things do exist. In fact, uh, I got <laughs> personal. Uh, confirmation that these things do exist. When I went to Rome, I went to Europe, uh, and here's the thing about Europe that no one ever says, but the evils of Europe are very medieval. Uh, you have the weirdities of America, and you have the weirdities of Europe. Both America and Europe are weird. I mean, the whole world is pretty weird. But America and Europe are weird in their own unique ways. America's weirdities are based on a weirdity that involves being completely cut off from our European origins. Americans will say, well, I'm part German, I'm part Irish, I'm part English, part Dutch, whatever. I'm, I'm like one-eighth Italian, you know, one-twentieth German or something. I'm one-one-hundredth Native American. They'll sit there and they'll tell you all these things, but they can't tell you about the German part of their family or the Irish part of their family or the, you know, the Scottish part because we're we're we essentially as a culture we decided to cut off the root of Europe. We decided to cut the European root off for the most part. Um, there are things from Europe that we still maintain. Uh, look at our government, our our constitution. A lot of these things can have can have influences found in Europe. Uh, but really, for the most part, we are um, we have severed ourselves from the European route, and so we're almost completely disconnected from Europe. Europe is a very different place from the United States. Uh, I laugh when I hear racist Americans talking about you know how we're European Americans. We are European Americans, and it's like 
Europeans will disagree. You're not European. Stop saying that. It's like, you know, I'm African-American. It's like, buddy, you're American, but you don't act African. Okay? People in Africa don't act like African-Americans. They don't act like American blacks. Uh, they're just two different cultures, two different, two different worlds, two different paradigms. And Europeans are very different uh, from Americans. Uh, Europeans... Um, it's it's kind of hard to it, it's it, it'll be a too long of too long of a video if I have to like really dig through my head as to you know what are the differences but they are definitely differences. You can feel the differences when you go to Europe. Uh, you just feel different. Like every country, I think, has a feeling. Like when I was in Spain, there was a feeling. When I was in Italy, there was a feeling. Um, when I went to Canada, there was no feeling because Canada is essentially uh, American. I mean, it's very American. Um, I, I didn't really have the sense that I was in a different country, but, you know, I never went to Quebec, and I'm pretty sure if I went to Quebec, I would have a different uh, opinion. I would feel like I'm a, I was in a different country. I will say, though, when I was in Hawaii, I felt like I was in a different country. I didn't feel like I was in America. When I was in Hawaii, I felt like I was in the Philippines. Uh, you know, I felt like I was somewhere in Southeast Asia. Like, this is not America. And so the, the Hawaii is, is very different. But, I mean, uh, if you go to any state of the United States, yeah, they have their differences, but... They still maintain that old American feeling and smell. Uh, but when I went to, to Italy, um, it just feels different there. You know, you see the buildings everywhere. You see buildings that are hundreds of years old. You see, um, of course, people speak a different language. So that, that, that definitely contributes to that atmosphere. Um, but at the same time, it's like people have different mentalities. People think differently over there. And the weirdities of Europe are medieval. The weirdities of America are really kind of recent. Uh, you know, we, we have obsessions with serial killers, and we got we got the shooters, the school shooters, and people who shoot up malls and theaters, and you know, um, pretty much anywhere. Uh, we have um, just just a lot of uh, I, I I don't want to. We have a lot of low class behavior. Okay, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit here and mince words. We we do have a, lo a lot of low class behavior. Now, Europe though has a lot of low class behavior, but in, in its own European way, uh, it's medieval. It's a medieval low classness. It's a, the evil is medieval. Um, the evil is medieval. Yeah. So that that rhymes. So uh, for example, when I was in Europe, um, I met a nun who told me that she has a friend who was a master kabbalist. And if you ever saw this nun, I went I went into this monastery. So I was in this village in Italy. It was a in a county in northern Italy called um, it was called uh, Pietro Rubia, which in English means Red Rock. So I was in Red Rock County in northern Italy. Uh, I was in a state called Emilia Romana, and and as romantic as that title may sound, there's not a lot of romance in this state. <laughs> Emilia Romana, it sounds so romantic, but it's not. Um, people there can be kind of uh, unwelcoming. Uh, people there can be kind of snobby. Uh, this is the north of Italy, so people there aren't as nice as the southerners. Um so, so when I was in, in Emilia Romana, I was in this monastery. And if you ever see the village that I that I went to, uh, it looked like something out of Resident Evil. Uh, it was uh, kind of creepy. Uh, they had me sleep in a dorm uh, that was outside of the premises of the monastery. This village probably had more or less maybe two hundred people living in it. It was a very small village. Uh, for a small village, they had a lot of restaurants. They had about. Uh, I only went to one of their restaurants, but I heard they had a second one, but I never saw it. Uh, and they had one gas station. And that's pretty much it. Um, you are uh, hours away from the nearest airport. Um, you Well, maybe not hours, but you're, you're, hour, you're about two hours away from Rome. Um, it's, it, but the, the, there's a lot of beautiful scenery in Emilia Romana. You see miles and miles of sunflower uh, farms and, and vineyards and tomatoes and t a lot of tobacco also was grown here. Um, but this village was, you know, it was it, it was like something out of a horror movie. Uh, I could definitely go to, the, if I ever had to film a horror film, I'd go to this village. Let's just put it that way. They had me sleep in a dorm. The dorm was in a, was, was a little edifice that was outside of the monastery, across the monastery. Um... They, they needed they needed a little bit of maintenance in this uh, in this monastery because when you walked in the monast when you walked into the dorm uh, and you turned the light on not all the lights would go off at the same time or they would like not all of them would just turn on immediately it, it would go like chick, 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 chick. I'm not even joking like the first light would turn on right and then 
the light, but it would still be dark, but you would see the 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 individual lights turn on successfully uh, successively uh, down the hallway. So it's like it's like something out of a horror film. Um, it was just it was just bizarre. Uh, but uh, the nuns there, um, they they were they were kind of hippieish hippieish very hippieish. Um, they looked like something out of the movie um, uh, Isperia. If you haven't seen that film, don't. Terrible movie. But that's what it reminded me of. They kind of reminded me of like a witch's coven. The mother superior was a woman by the name of Maria Gloria Riva. And Riva, uh, Miss Riva, was uh, involved in the occult. I firmly believe that. Uh, she told me that one of her close friends was a master Kabbalist. She said that this man is a saint. And when a man is a master Kabbalist, especially in Europe, they are occultists. And so her close friend is an occultist who she deems as, quote, a saint. Um, she, uh, she was into very, very strange artwork, uh, artwork that, had, that, that looked like idols, really, um, and also, she believed that um, she believed that God had a feminine nature. This is what she teaches: that God had a feminine nature. This is what she was teaching people. Uh, she still teaches this. Um, she claimed that she had a vision from Jesus uh, one night. She went to a nightclub before she was a nun, and I think uh, I don't know if she got drunk or not, but she claimed that Jesus began speaking to her. That she got hit by a car. And she saw Jesus, and she had a vision. And this is what she tells people. She has numerous connections within the Vatican. Um, uh, Gloria Riva also gets funding from a guy uh, by the name of... Um, I forgot his first name, but his last name is Troiano. And Mr. Troiano was involved in the communist underground in France, but he converted into the right-wing uh, political uh, strata. Uh, the whole thing was just absolutely just plain ass bizarre. It was a, it was a very bizarre thing. But the fact that this woman was involved in the occult, um, and she's a nun, well, with strong connections in the Vatican, it, it confirmed to me that all the stories we read about from the medieval period or from the Renaissance period are true. Stories of monks and and nuns involved in the occult. Stories of priests involved in the occult and involved in Satan worship. These things happened. They did, and they still happen. The weirdities of the past are still amongst us. They don't go away. After the Second World War, the Nazis, not after, but nearing the end of the Second World War, the Nazis uh, had a big meeting in France. And in this meeting, they had all of the big corporate leaders, all the big corporatists in, in the Third Reich. And they got together and they said, we know the war is going to end. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? They decided to put all their money in Switzerland, in a Swiss bank. They say Switzerland was a neutral country. They weren't that neutral. They wanted that money. And Switzerland absorb, absorbed all the Nazi money. And then after the Second World War was over, the Germans took that money and they used it to help rebuild their country. You think those Nazis just went away? They didn't go away. They're still here. They're still here. Anyway, you guys just heard some Theo Lodgy. God bless.